Hi, I'm Brian Granulati, President and CEO of the Atlantic Health System. At Atlantic Health, we believe in helping our communities stay informed about the health care issues that affect them every day. That's why we're proud to support health care programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Agnes Veris NJTV studio at 2 Gateway. Funding has been provided by Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, Atlantic Health System, Building Healthier Communities, NJM Insurance Group, the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, founded by the Jewish community, NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology, New Jersey Resources, and by Summit Medical Group, a multi-specialty medical practice providing comprehensive care from birth and pediatrics to geriatric care concentrating in general wellness, cancer treatment, disease management, and behavioral health. Promotional support provided by AM970, The Answer, and by NJ Advance Media. State of Affairs. I'm Steve Adubato. We're coming to you from the Agnes Farris NJTV studio in Newark, New Jersey. Once again, we're joined by our friend Patricia Teffenhart, who is executive director of the New Jersey Coalition Against Sexual Assault. Good to see you, Pat. Nice to have, nice to have you. Oh, my gosh. No, it's great thank to have you. you. Well, thank you. And while you're doing that, you tell folks what the organization is, we'll put up your website right away. Let yeah, you know. we're the New Jersey Coalition Against Sexual Assault. We've been around since 1981. Um, and we represent New Jersey's 21 county-based rape crisis centers and the Rutgers University Office of Violence Prevention and Victim Assistance, and we are really busy right now. Um, you know, I've asked you this before. I'm going to ask you in a different way. Yeah. Is there more, are there more sexual assaults taking place? Or is there a whole societal, environmental thing going on where just there's more reporting of what, is, what has been happening all along? Definitely more reporting of what's been happening. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we've been around since 1981, and I would argue that my predecessors were clamoring for opportunities to have interviews like this, or to have bills represented, representing survivors in the legislature. Sure. Um, and now people are actually really paying attention. Um, for and real? Versus, hey, this is what we're doing right now, it's a bit of a fad, which it's anything but that. That is an excellent question. Um, I, I don't would... have the answers. I just have the questions. But seriously, <laughs> do you see this potentially a year from now? Hey, didn't we already do that thing? So I would think if you had asked me this question a year ago, at the beginning of the Me Too movement, I might have been very skeptical. I quite honestly remain moderately skeptical. Um, this is a really hot topic for people to make their name on right now, right? To write a good article on it, to introduce a good bill, um, to say they're on the right side of the issue is a lot easier than to actually be on the right side of the Define issue. The difference. So talking the talk means, you know, we're gonna introduce a whole bunch of conversations about policy reform. Walking the walk means actually engaging subject matter experts and then introducing the policies and moving them through the state house. And so I think there's an opportunity for us to walk the walk, but right now, currently, there's a lot of talking going on. This is uh, Patricia Teffenhart, who is Executive Director of New Jersey Coalition Against Sexual Assault. Steve Adubato here, this is State of Affairs. I'm curious about this. Those of us in the media who've been very focused on this, many, put it this way, too many of our colleagues in the media have not just been accused, but have acknowledged their behavior uh, in this regard, which is just deplorable and unacceptable and disgusting. A role that we have. I think everybody has a role to play, and it's different not... for the media. Yes, only because again, going back to walking the walk and talking the talk are two what very important be doing? things. Holding each other accountable, as I think is being done in ways that are more significant than before. Um, allowing zero tolerance policies to really reign supreme in the workplace, and that's not just for individuals in media; that's for all workplaces. Sure. 
right? If we say we want to create a more just and equitable work environment, then we actually have to follow through when disclosures come forward and mm. hold those people accountable. And that means we also have to do the right thorough investigations to get to the bottom of the truth. You know, it's interesting, Patricia, there are some friends of mine. There's a president of the United States who, no disrespect, but is not a friend of mine. Um, not, I don't mean in a negative way. Very concerned about uh, false accusations against men. My God, you make the accusation, that person's career is over. How can we, we've got to get the pendulum back. Yeah. You say? Oh my gosh, we hear that all the time. So do I. Uh, individuals that don't have anything to be fearful of are not actually fearful. Um, and I would argue that the stats actually operate in the other direction. For every 1,000, this is actual statistics from the Federal Department of Justice. For every 1,000 sexual assaults, 332 of them will be reported to police. Six of them will land in a conviction. What? Yeah. So therefore, the vast majority of accusations do not end in anyone being convicted. Yep, exactly. So this whole thing about, oh my God, you accuse someone, their career is over, that's it. Right. The facts don't back it up, the stats don't back it up. Absolutely not. And when we look at what does that mean, right? So a lot of times, and particularly as we speak about employment law, for example, employers will say, well, we did a background check. Right. Well, what does a background check, check show if people aren't actually being convicted of these crimes? It shows nothing. Mm. The governor affirmed that in the spring of this year. He signed a bill into law that recognized that mm -hmm. people working in our schools were going through hiring loopholes. They weren't being held accountable because That's they right. weren't being convicted of these crimes and background checks weren't showing their true behaviors. So it's not just school teachers and people working in schools, it's everyone. It's also the uh, Catholic Church. Now I'm gonna try this again, we're gonna try to get it right. We're gonna talk about the Catholic Church, the sexual abuse cases that have been going on for a really long time. The statute of limitations there and in other places is two years. Yes. We're gonna repeat something. We've been asking and will continue to ask the, um, the Archbishop, the Cardinal, Cardinal Tobin here in Newark once again to come in. His office says that he wants to come in. I've lost count of the number of times we've asked. We will ask again, correct, Jackie? And we'll hopefully get him here. Yeah. He's not the only one to talk about this, but he's the uh, most significant figure in the Catholic Church. Why is that relevant as it relates to the statute of limitations for sexual assault? It's everything right now. And in fact, this is the perfect conversation at the perfect time. Um, I was invited to meet with the Cardinal back at the beginning of September, right, as the Attorney General was launching. And how did that meeting go? Um, it was a lot of good talking, and there has been zero action on their part since we met. Um, in fact, we've launched a statewide petition that has over 375 signatures, as I walked in here today, of individuals that are looking to expand the civil statute of limitations, not just for those who have been harmed by the Catholic Church, but really a two-year civil statute of limitations for sexual assault, and we have a six-year civil statute of limitations for trespassing. Hold on, six years for trespassing? Yes. Two years for sexual assault? Mm -hmm. And sexual assault is recognized as the second most violent crime, second only murder. to murder. Yes. Two years. Yes. What should it be? Ideally, we would abolish the civil statute of limitations. It would be the most trauma-informed response to a crime this horrific. It would mirror what we have for criminal statute of limitations in New Jersey. It's not my understanding the legislature has the appetite for that. But the appetite? Yeah. What do they have an appetite for, eight years, 10 years? What I is think it? it'd be really interesting to take a look at how much money the Catholic Church has spent lobbying the legislature over the last decade and how much money they've invested mm -hmm. in actually stopping good policy from moving forward. Thank you, Pat. Thank you. I'm Steve Adubato. This is State of Affairs. We'll be right back. To see more State of Affairs with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at stateofaffairsnj.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Welcome back our good friend Jim McGreevy, former governor of the great state of New Jersey and chairman of New Jersey Ranchi Corporation. Good to see you, Jim. It's good to be here. Thank you, Stephen. Jim, a report you and your team just put out, um, New Jersey Opioid Addiction Report, a modern plague. Describe why, it, what is it and why does it matter so much? Stephen, the advent of synthetic opioids, fentanyl and carfentanyl, has been a profound game changer. Um, fentanyl is 50 times, carfentanyl is 100 times stronger than morphine. 
It's a synthetic opioid. It's What's the, sorry, sorry, Jim. Fentanyl, I know. What's the other one? Carfentanyl, which is even a stronger version of fentanyl. It's what they use in Africa to take down a full-grown African bull elephant in 20 minutes. And this synthetic opioid is so powerful that DEA no longer uses the dogs. Agents now wear bodysuits because the fact that three grains of sand, the equivalent of that fentanyl, um, a, a client can survive, but four grains, you suffer overdose and death. And now the naltrexone, uh, which we use to bring back people temporarily, you need four administrations. So this is so powerful. I mean, I just did, um, last week, we just did toxicology reports at our nine reentry sites, and there's no more heroin in the heroin anymore in the sense that people are consuming the synthetic opioid mixed with whatever derivative. And so that this is so powerful, so corrosive, that it's, it's destroying lives faster and more permanently than anything we've ever seen. Jim, but, but your organization um, dealing with reentry, those who have been incarcerated sure. are coming back into society, what is the connection between the opioid crisis and the incarcerated population? So and there are two, two points. One, that, that people coming out of prison or out of jail are 130 times more likely to die because they're coming out and all of a sudden they're going to go back to the same usage, the same amount, and they, they take it they overdose and they die. The second point in the state of New Jersey, we have one of the highest conflations. If you're in prison in the state of New Jersey, there's an 80% chance you're an addict or alcoholic. And if you're an addict or alcoholic, there's a high probability that you're going to wind your way into the criminal justice system or death. There's a high conflation between addiction and imprisonment in the state of New Jersey. And what we saw in this report, Stephen, is that Thanks to the leadership of Senator Vitale and Governor Christie. Senator Joe Vitale. Senator Joe Vitale. Chairman of the Senate Health Committee, go ahead. Yeah, and, 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 and Governor Christie on a bipartisan basis said, all right, we need to provide for treatment. Why for would you be talking about the previous governor in this? Because I, I think the, the governor did a phenomenal job in sort of grappling with the addiction crisis and at least bringing everybody to the table. But what we did is we required in the state of New Jersey, 28 days of residential treatment and up to three months of intensive outpatient. But fentanyl is so powerful. Dr. Gasparin of Harvard said it takes 14 months. After one administration, it takes 14 months for your brain to go back to where it was before that administration. That there's such significant neural damage to the mind. And so that 28 days is not gonna solve it. So we've been working with Blue Cross Blue Shield and Suzanne Horizon. Kuznis, Her Horizon, uh, and who's been like... <laughs> Suzanne is a policy person? Yeah, I, I think she's like one of the 10 smartest people in the state of New Jersey. Uh, but you know, to realize what was happening is young men and women were going into treatment for 28 days, coming out, using again, relapsing, going into treatment 28 days, coming out, using again. And it was happening six, seven, eight times. And then Stephen, they die. And so, well, we, we looked at the best practices in Rhode Island and Massachusetts and Texas, and what they say, it has to be a year model. It doesn't mean that the person's going away for a year. They can be in, they can be in an Oxford house. They can be in a, in a residential program, but they have to see the same doctor. They have to see the same psychiatrist. And so, you know, what, what's happening in New Jersey is, I, Jim can go into Integrity House, and then I come out and I can go to Ava's Village and then I can come out and I can go to another facility. But my records aren't following me. You know, take for example, if, if you, were had, you were a cancer patient and you had surgery, they the would, would follow you, the records would follow. Right. Your Why would it be chemo different with someone who's suffering, suffering from an opioid addiction, heroin addiction? You know, addiction? I, I think, Stephen, candidly, it, it goes back to the fact that um, before President Bush and, and, and Senator Kennedy provided for parity between behavioral health and medical health, in, candidly, our behavioral health system was fragmented, and we're suffering. We didn't from, care that much, Jim. Did no, we? we didn't. And, and I can it's make an argument. The chase. We, we, and, we didn't. We didn't care when black and brown people were suffering in the middle of a cocaine epidemic. And and, and but. At, Where and, are we now? What? Where are we now? I mean, you, you talked about Governor Christie. You served as governor. You talked about Senator Vitale. Where do you see the Governor Murphy administration on this issue in terms well, of addressing the issues you're raising right now in this report? Well, you know, God, uh, Carol Johnson. Um, one of the commissioners. One of the, the commissioners of human cabinet. services. 
uh, Dr. Sharif of, of the Department of Health. Commissioner of Health. Commissioner of Health. I believe they want to get this done, and uh, with the leadership of Joe Vitale, I believe we're going to move from a 28-day model to year model so that... What would it take to do that? Is it legislation? It's legislation. It's legislation. Has the and governor Blue made Cross, a statement on this? Um, the governor's responded to the report. The attorney general's responded to the report positively. Did they, did they acknowledge that they're committed to a year-long process? Um, I, I think and the, the economics involved in that? Well, it's not actually Blue it's Cross Blue Shield. It's not economics? I, no, no. At Blue Cross Blue Shield, uh, Horizon will actually argue it's less expensive because what's happening... How can it be less expensive if you're because, in for longer and treatment no, no, costs more? Because what happens is, Stephen, is, is that if you're in there for a short time up front, and you have all the clinical, the medical, the psychiatric, and then you have a step-down model, and then you have a further step-down, you're back into the community, and you're working it, and you're productive. The point is, is like a family. We're, we're following you from the beginning to the end. Uh, and it's not the back and forth? No, it's, the not, back and forth it's, it's, it's not the in and out, in and, and out, out, in so and out. Not. And so what happens is you're going to have medication-assisted treatment, and this is a big part of it. Uh, like, I'm an old AA, NA guy, but this, these this is so powerful, the fentanyl, that you need Suboxone, you need Naltrexone in order to, to wean the person off. We need a different approach. You need a different approach, but you have to lock down that person. You have to be all over that person from beginning to end for that year, and that's with the doctor, the behavioral psychologist, and the psychiatrist. Before I let you go, increasing access to the drugs you're talking about, to the treatment you're talking about, biggest obstacle in the way of that, I've asked you this before, yeah, it, it hasn't happened. Um, it's frustrating because, it, you know, part of it is Medicaid and Carol Johnson. I think she's she's making great strides. I've said, you know, for my guys coming out of prison, they're they're dying. I have in my phone three photographs of men that have died this past week. I mean, this isn't cutting the parkway in long. In connection with in connection, the opioid crisis. Yeah, in connection with opioid crisis, they come out of prison and they they they're using again, and then they overdose. And so, my point is. When, when people like Suzanne Kuznick says, we can do this better, we can do this less expensively, but we have to connect these systems. Mm. In Vermont, it's called a hub and spoke. You come and get your MAT, we'll connect you to medication-assisted treatment. You'll get right. your Suboxone, you'll get your Naltrexone, and then we'll connect you to housing, we'll connect you to, to benefits, we'll connect you to, to job so placement. Vermont's doing it well. Vermont's doing well, it's Massachusetts, like it can't be done. Texas. Other it can state, be done. Texas. Yeah. We're, it and can so, be done. And we're going, we're going to have 3,000 people. I went to a funeral about eight months ago with a family that lost their second child. To this? To this. And this is, Stephen, this was the most buttoned up, old fashioned Catholic family, did everything right. It's their kids with their knucklehead friends. I mean, the same way you and right. I at some point would have done Jägermeister or whatever stupid thing. Something stupid. Th th this stuff, you don't come back from. Jim McGreevy. So we need to get this done. Thank you, Stephen. No, no. Every time you join us, um, not just we learn something new, we're challenged. And I hope the folks in the State House, where uh, you know better than most, respond. Not just Senator Vitale, but others. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, my friend. You got it. That's good. Take care of yourself. Same Thank to you. you. Be right back right after this. To see more State of Affairs with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at stateofaffairsnj.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. This is Steve Adubato. We are in Atlantic City. This is the 165th. New Jersey Education Association Convention. We're once again talking to the executive director of the NJEA, Ed Richardson. Good to see you, Ed. Good to see you, too. Thanks for being here, Steve. Uh, every year we've come here, there's energy, there's excitement. What makes this year particularly special? Um, I think just the fact that um, our educators feel a new mood in the state, really from the top, from the leadership of Governor Murphy. Uh, our education commissioner, Lamont Repolet, is here. We just talked um, to him. That's a big deal to have the education commissioner here. It is. Um, the commissioner has always come and done a session, and Dr. Repolet will be doing that. But uh, the commissioner came here last night, had dinner with us, spoke to our uh, staff and our leaders, will be doing that session. But he's here all morning. 
uh, walking around, talking with you, talking with educators, and that's what he wants to do. And that's, that's a really important signal, I think, to send to our members, that the uh, commissioner of education, someone who came up through the ranks as a practitioner, as a teacher, a principal, a superintendent, wants to be here among them and hear from them. The other thing that is, I don't know if it's different, Ed, but the conversation that's so critical. You and I talk a lot about the state of, quote unquote, political discourse in our state, in our nation. Your organization put out a very public statement about the tone of public discourse, its connection to violence, and the role of educators in that regard. How important is improving um, and making more civil, if you will, our political discourse? It's, it's so vitally important from a, a policy standpoint. We have challenges that we face in New Jersey, across the nation. We will never be able to address those challenges unless we learn how to talk to each other in a cooperative and respectful way. There will always be issues of disagreement, uh, whether it's across party enemies? lines. Are hmm? we disagree? Are we enemies? No, we don't have to be. But what's the role of, edu of education and educators in all this? That's the really difficult thing. Our members are out there teaching our students about how to have respectful uh, discourse, about how to discuss ideas and debate them, even when we disagree, and still be able to, you know, come out as friends, and at least as uh, as, as peers respecting each other's point who of view. respect each even other, even if we disagree. Even if That's we disagree. That's the role of an educator. I think so. Yeah, uh, parents, of course, as, as well, sure. families, but. Um, so there we are trying to teach our kids uh, those values. And, and yet what, do we what see they adults? see uh, <laughs> from the adults who are, are leading our nation is a, a way different kind of a, a, a dynamic. And so that is the difficulty for our members here. How do we navigate uh, that, that difference? I talked to uh, Marie Bliston, um, your president, about this. Talked to the commissioner of education about it. I want to ask you, school safety. We talked about the, I know where the organization is when it comes to putting guns in the hands of teachers, even well-trained, against it. Against it. Can we talk school bus safety? The horrific accident that happened, um, with so many children at risk, victims, if you will. What are we doing there? So uh, we were among uh, the very first organizations 20 plus years ago to call for seat belts in school buses and the state ultimately adopted a statute. Uh, New Jersey was one of the first to require them. We're now talking about three-point safety belts in school buses. Or explain to folks what that means. Basically right now, the belts that are required are the, are the lap belts, which um, you know anybody who's been around uh, as long as I have remembers that was the right. standard in passenger vehicles. Not anymore. Um, not anymore. You get in you a car now and much. it's natural. You have a three-point seat belt coming across. Why shouldn't our children have that in a school bus? So that is uh, one of the policies. What's standing in the way of that? Um, it's expensive, obviously, but um, you know you can't put a price on, on uh, the safety of our students. Uh, the tragedy that you referenced not only uh, affected children and their families, but we did lose one of our members in, in that accident. And so um, you know everybody is affected here. And, and so I think we owe it to our children, our families, our educators to uh, provide the very best safety equipment we can on, on, the, on the buses. Now, I have to say that uh, the backdrop of all this is from a passenger vehicle mile standpoint, there is no safer vehicle on the road than a school bus. So it's not that we have a, a, a horrible track record, but one tragedy is one too many and, yep. and we have to figure out how and, to And to Ed's point before we get off this, when we drop our, when we bring our daughter to the school bus in our hometown and she gets on that bus, it does cross my mind, and I know I speak for, for many, many parents watching and listening right now, you can't be safe enough. Right, right. The other element of that also is, um, you know, who's driving that bus? We have, you know, we have high standards in terms of, uh, uh, you know, commercial driver licenses and other training programs. Um, we believe that the other element of that is having a district employed driver in that bus, somebody who knows the community, somebody who likely knows some of those very parents and their children, develops relationships over a period of years. That's important too. One more quick one. I know you were with us on State of Affairs and we touched on it. I'm going to go a little deeper in the time we have left. We had the President of the State Senate, uh, Steve Sweeney, talking about his plan to gain, as he believes, more fiscal responsibility in the state. And he did bring up, and you know this, going back and revisiting 
the question of public employee pensions, health benefits, you say? We've come to the table. We've had extensive conversations with the administration and developed um, a host of cost saving uh, uh, solutions that are right now being implemented. So um, not to get into the weeds on this, but a new uh, plan for uh, uh, educate, education retirees that will save the state $180 million a year. Um, we went to the table uh, a few years ago with the senator's help because we needed legislation for this to change the manner in which the state bids its prescription program. That resulted in a $1.5 billion savings over three years, and we're about to go back and rebid it to try and, and uh, reap even more cost savings, probably in the neighborhood of 100 to 150 million a year. There, there are things that can be done to improve the way insurance is procured and delivered and the way healthcare is, is delivered to uh, reap huge savings without automatically diminishing uh, the level of benefits that people pay. The other issue that we have is as a result of a law passed in 2011, we have members all over this state, educators, who are taking home less net pay from one year to the next. And the reason for that is the law required certain levels of health care premium sharing and um, they are now exceeding any raises that people are getting. So, you know, you get a small raise over here, but your health care premium goes up by this much. We've got to end that. We cannot continue to have negative net pay year over year over year. Um, one legislator we spoke with about this said, um, uh, going and doing the same or better work each year for less pay is crazy. I don't want crazy people teaching our children. And so um, we have to fix that. Ed Richardson is the executive director of the New Jersey Education Association. We're here at the 165th NJA Convention in Atlantic City. Ed, thank you so much. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate it. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Agnes Veris NJTV studio at 2 Gateway. Funding has been provided by Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, Atlantic Health System, NJM Insurance Group, the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, NJIT, New Jersey Resources, and by Summit Medical Group. I think at NJIT there are a lot of smart students. I came to NJIT for mechanical engineering because within state it's one of uh, probably the top three schools for engineering. It sort of creates a friendly competition where you know you can learn from them. It's a great academic school. I feel I'm being challenged, but at the same time, I love the classes I'm taking. The atmosphere of being here is like a, being at an upstart company. It's that same kind of drive, that same kind of passion. 